بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الشهد لا إله إلا الله وعشر محمد عبده رسول ما بعد السلام عليكم الحمد لله I didn't have to ask him to repeat that did I you're listening to and watching Islam tomorrow broadcasting live today all the way from here in Sydney Australia your host Yusuf Estes and for the next little bit we want to be talking about the miracles of Muhammad for those of you who are not familiar with the subject of Muhammad, those who are watching this for the first time, you don't know a lot about it, this is a great opportunity to learn. Those of you that are Muslims watching this in the future, we'd like to remind you that presenting the case of Muhammad in simple English terms for the non-Muslim is a very good way to give the invitation or the da'wah. So that's what we're going to start with. We're going to be talking about the Quran and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Before we read from the Quran, we say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, which basically means I seek refuge with Allah from the evil of the cursed devil. And when I say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this more or less translates to English as peace and blessings be upon him. When this is something we say about all of our prophets. Before I get started with this, though, I would like to give a little introduction or glossary to the terms I'll be using. When we say Allah, we don't necessarily mean just God, because Allah has a specific meaning in the Arabic language, not just God, but the only God. Elah is the word in Arabic for God. Aliha is the plural. In English, you put a S afterwards. The word Islam means the submission to God to do what he wants you to do rather than obeying your evil self or your following your vain desires. So whoever believes in the one true God that is never having any partners, the God of the universe, the God of Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus and Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon them all. And they want to do what God wants them to do. Basically, they're saying that they want to do Islam. And Islam, a person who does it, is a Mu-Islam or Muslim. So when I use the terms, for those who are not familiar with this, this is all it means. I'm going to begin by mentioning some of the miracles of Muhammad wasallam. The first and foremost miracle, which all of us are familiar with, is the Quran itself. The word Quran in Arabic does not mean a book. The word in Arabic for book is kitab. Although we refer to the kitab of Allah, meaning the book of Allah, when we speak of Quran, it actually means that which is being recited. You cannot hold Quran in your hand because you can't hold a recitation. This is in your throat or in your heart or in your mind. You can hold the book that represents it, but in Arabic, that's called Fusha, or the Mus'haf. This is the scripture of Islam. Now, the Quran was revealed over a 23-year period, starting in the year 610 on the Christian calendar, and it continued in Revelation for 23 years until the death of Muhammad Wasallam. It started with the words Iqra, Bismi Rabbik Allah, the Khalaq, and it ends, depending on if you go by the actual last specific words or the last surah. The last surah revealed is Idja an Nasrullahi wal Fat. The last words were Al Yaumul Akmaltu Lakum Dinakum. And now to give translation to that, the first revelation it comes to Muhammad, peace be upon him, while he's in a cave in Jabal Nur, the mountain of light outside of Mecca. And the angel comes to him and orders him to recite. When we translate to English, a lot of people use the word read. And this takes us pretty far away from a meaning here. Because Iqra 
actually means to do Quran because it comes from the same word. So if I said the Quran is recitation, means recitation, and I tell you to do Iqara, I'm telling you to recite, not read. Although that's another word for reciting. But to be specific about it because we're going to be talking about some revelations before the Quran which testify to this event. And for instance, in the book of Isaiah, which is in the Old Testament, it tells us in chapter 40 that the one, talking about Muhammad, peace be upon him, will be ordered to cry. He'll be ordered, cry out, what shall I cry out? So a crier, that's another word used a long time ago in England for a person who made announcements or one who recited. He was the town crier. So this is exactly right because he will say what he hears. There will not be of his own words. Check it out. When you have a Bible sometime, look at it. Chapter 40 in the book of Isaiah. And you'll see that this describes exactly the event that took place in the cave of Hirat on Jabal Nur. Now, when we talk about the Quran, there are those who will say that he just wrote it himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals certain words in the Quran that make it clear. Have not the unbelievers considered that if this, meaning the Quran, were from other than Allah, they would find within it many contradictions. Well, that's a fair challenge, isn't it? If you're in doubt about it, then see if you find any contradictions. And in another verse, he says, if you're in doubt about it, bring a book like it. 1,400 years and nobody's done that. I want to read to you from the Quran in a, a third challenge. When Allah says, this is the Arabic, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitani Rajeem. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَّا عَبْدِي نَفَأْتُ بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِكِينَ This translates more or less to the English saying, and if you guys, and it's talking to the ignorant and polytheistic of the Quraysh, or the tribes, of the Arab tribes at the time, and to the Jews and Christians, if you're in doubt concerning that which we have sent down to our servant, meaning Muhammad, then bring a surah like it. Surah means like a chapter of it. And call your witnesses beside Allah if you're truthful. I do want to mention that in the Arabic language, the term w w plural was used. It seems like it's saying we, like there's more than one Allah. But that is because it's the royal we, because Allah cannot be made plural. The word itself can't even be made plural. So whenever you hear a we in the Quran, that is simply the royal we, like when the king or the queen gives any decree, they say we are decreeing the following, and there's only one person. It's the royal we. That verse indicates to us that if somebody wanted to really challenge this, all they would have to do is bring a surah like it. Surah like it. And if you were going to do it, you probably wouldn't want to try to attack or, or compete against Surah Baqarah, would you? That's 286 ayahs or verses, and it's pretty complex. In fact, ayah number 282 is like the largest ayah in the whole Quran. It takes a whole page. And nobody would want to even try that one ayah. But there is a surah, a complete surah in the Quran. It says, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna a'tainakul kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, inna shani akuhul abdhar. This is the smallest surah of the Quran. 
chapter 108, Surah al kalthar Yet nobody has been able to meet the challenge to produce a chapter like this in 1400 years. Now, some people have put things together, even put it on the internet. One of the websites used to be called Surah Like It. <laughs> dot com. It was put together by some Arabs, not Muslim. I don't know if they were trying to attack Islam or trying to demonstrate a stupid sense of humor. Some of the Muslims became just violently and vehemently upset about this and they insisted this website had to be taken down it was causing international problems etc etc but i said leave them alone man it's proof if that's the best you can do because if you read it it didn't even make any sense the profound meaning behind what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals can't be matched, nor can the beautiful Arabic language. The verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran are not such that can be approached by anybody, regardless, Muslim or non-Muslim, nobody can come up with something like it. I would like to give you a sense, though, of what the meaning to the English more or less would be. For sure, Allah has granted you, he uses the term, we have granted you, Muhammad, al kawthar And al kawthar is a river in paradise. Therefore, turn to him in prayer, to your Lord, and sacrifice to him only. For the one who hates you, Muhammad, he will be cut off. Now, the last word used in this ayah is abtar. Abtar. Have you known this word? How many of you know what it means? Abtar. They used to cut the tail of the dog off. This was something, people still do that today. Certain kinds of dogs when they're born, they cut the tail really short. That's abtar. When you cut something off, you cut it off short. And they were making fun of Muhammad وسلم, at the death of his son. When his little son died, he was still young, very young. I think a year and a half or something like this, 13 months, I don't remember the exact age. But it was a baby and he was dying. And Muhammad وسلم, arrived in time to hold him in his arms and his son died in his arms. The enemies of Islam began to make fun of him because he had no sons that had ever survived. He never did have any sons that survived. And that was like his last child born that was a male and he died. So they were saying, you're cut off. You're cut off. You're abtar. Because you're not going to have any genealogy. You're not going to have any sons to continue your religion. And that's true, he never had any sons. He had grandsons through his daughter Fatima. But that's not our point. The point is, they made fun of him for being, as they said, cut off. And Allah said to him that for sure, there's a river for you, Kawthar. Now, most of you know that this is the river where you're going to take your first drink from, is it right? And the Prophet Sallallahu is going to be there to offer you that drink. Is that right? And we're all looking forward to that. That's Kawthar. We make dua for that every day. I want that. I want to go there. I want to get that drink. All of us. Now, here in this very short, short surah, Allah has covered a lot of information mentioning about this river in paradise that Allah has granted for him so that he doesn't become, don't become concerned. There's something better for you than what these people are making fun of you. And so just make your salah to Allah. Just keep worshiping Allah and sacrificing for him. 
Because the one that hates you, the one that's making fun of you, this is the guy that's cut off. And he's cut off big time because he's cut off from any posterity and anything good in this world and anything good in the next world. All of this is coming in the meaning. This is from the tafsir, by the way, of Ibn Kathir and others. And it's narrated on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, none of you will have faith till he loves me more than his father, his children, and all mankind. That's in Sahih Bukhari. So, even though he has no sons, biologically, all of us are more to him than his son would have been because why we love him more than we would love our own father or our own children or even ourselves so isn't that beautiful that's a that's a beautiful talk about the opposite of what they said he has more now there's a few more points that go along with that not only do the muslims love him respect him and honor him more than their own blood ties But they also ask for Allah's mercy and peace be upon him many times every day. When we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim in Ahamidun Majid. And we say this over and over in our salah. And we say it over and over during the day. And anytime we mention his name, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many of you know the famous hadith of the Rasul Sallallahu which took place right before the beginning of uh, Ramadan one year. This is at the end of uh, Shaban. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu mounted a step. He stepped on a step and he said, Amin. Then he stepped on the next step and he said, Amin. And he stepped up higher and he said, Amin. And he came back down. They said, what is that? He said, you didn't see it, but the angel Jibreel had come to me and there were three things that he said to him one of them was that somebody would hear Muhammad's name and not say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this person would be cursed cursed is the one who hears your name and doesn't say that and he said Amin so this is real important for us that we always say that and there were two others but this isn't our point so I'm going to just jump off of that and go on the next thing, when we talk about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are many of the things in the Quran, the science, if you don't have this book, you should get it. It's called A Brief Illustrated Guide to Understanding Islam. You can get it through our website, you can get it here at the local radio station, you can get it at the, over at the youth center, a lot, of, a lot of places that you can pick this thing up. It was written, by the way, or compiled actually by Ibrahim, Abu Harb Ibrahim. And uh, he's in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The illustrations in it are taken from science books out of the library, with permission, of course, showing things that they've only discovered in the last century about the Earth, planets, the universe, embryology, the rivers, the seas, the list goes on. And then it mentions in here the verses of the Quran that prove for sure this had to come from Allah because nobody knew it 1400 years ago. They didn't even know it 140 years ago. And here it is in this amazing book. And never with a contradiction. There are some other points when we talk about the Quran. One of them is when we say nobody can bring a book like it is there another book on earth that has around 10 million people that memorized it huh any book telephone book encyclopedia dictionary any book is there any book that was written 1400 years ago in any language of any size at all that people memorize today and you get 10 million people memorized it and that's a joke nobody will believe you how could it be 
that this many people are memorizing. And check this out. They're memorizing it in exactly the way it was recited in the exact language of Fushab or the classical Arabic. And guess what? Around 85% of those people are not Arabs. And Arabic is not their native language. Whoa. Whoa. In fact, there's no other religion that has such a book or anything close to it because no other religion promotes the idea of memorizing the text. In fact, if people did, they'd figure out pretty fast that their religion was a little weird. <laughs> the Catholic Church for more than 1,000 years forbid anyone, anyone who was not authorized such as a priest or so on, to even have a Bible. And if you tried to translate the Bible to another language, you would be killed. This was not a joke. In the year 1511, in England, the Bible was translated by William Tyndale from Latin into English. When they found him with it, they tied it to him and tied him up and burned him to death with a book on his chest. That's a fact. They didn't know he had a copy. William Coverdale, one of his students, came up with another version of it in about 1528 or something like that. There was another Bible later, 50 years after that, and then in 1611, a group got together and tried to make another translation based on older manuscripts that were Greek, from Kone Greek rather than the Latin, trying to get a little closer to the original, and that was called the authorized version of the Bible. But guess what? It had to be retranslated the next year because it had so many mistakes. It's true. That I read in the history of translations of the Bible to the English language by F.F. So, nobody has a book like the Quran. That's one. I want to mention a few other things about our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's mentioned, as I already told you, in the Bible, but I want to give you another reference out of the Bible. In the English Bible, what survived, we know the real Bible's not there, but just what's left even, it says. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, it's talking about, that's the Old Testament, okay? That says that God's telling Moses that I'm going to raise up for the future generations of Israel, is what he's talking about. A prophet like you from amongst their brethren or brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Tell me what other prophet after Moses spoke in the name of Allah. Do you know? Because the prophet always said Bismillah, Bismillah in the name of Allah. Was there any other prophet who spoke in the name of Allah. Anybody know? No? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Anybody thought about it yet? Minutes up. It's a New York minute. It's in, it's in Surah Anamal which means the ant. Huh? Suleiman. Nah. Nah. This is when Suleiman, or Solomon as we call him in English, wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to Bilkist, or to Bathsheba, and he started it out like that, when he said, Innahu min Suleimana wa innahu bismillahir rahim it says, verily this is from 
Solomon in verily in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful and that's how every surah of the Quran starts except one a tawbah anyway imagine exactly what Allah has said that this prophet will come and speak in his name and that's Muhammad Sallallahu we conclude from this that Muhammad was predicted in the Old Testament but he's also predicted in the New Testament according to the Gospel of John if you haven't read it you might peek at it sometime check it out I recommend you look at chapters 14 and 16 because he's talking about somebody coming after him the word in the Kone Greek was parakletos that's the way I pronounce it it's a dead language we don't really know how they said it but it's what it looks like on paper there's a it's a very long word but there's one letter that looks a little different if you change that letter the word is exactly meaning the praised one and that's what Muhammad means in any case it happens in the book of John the first chapter the Pharisees who are the leaders or scribes for the Sanhedrin which in Arabic is Majlis Shura for the temple have approached Yahya, John the Baptist, because he's preaching and healing people and baptizing them and, you know, he's fasting and doing stuff and they're, they're, they're wondering, who are you? According to the Bible, they approach him and they say, who are you? Are you Elijah? Because in the Old Testament, they're looking for Elijah to come back, one of the prophets that they ran off. I mean, they killed a lot of their prophets and tortured them and stuff, but... Elijah was one that they thought was coming back. So they said, are you Elijah? Or are you the Messiah? And that's translated as Christ. Or are you that prophet? And to each of these, he said no. And then they said, well, if you're not Elijah, and if you're not the Messiah, and you're not that prophet, then who are you? We all know about Elijah. He's mentioned in the Old Testament. Everybody knows the Messiah is Jesus. You know, uh, we know that from the Quran. He's the Messiah. That's what Allah said. Messiah. But who's that prophet? Who is that prophet? And when you read, as I mentioned, chapters 14 and 16, there's some other references in Matthew and other places in the Bible. Even surviving, you know who it is is none other than Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, I want to make this comparison when it says in Deuteronomy a prophet from their brethren. Who are the brethren to the Bani Israel? Who are the brethren? Because these are descendants of Ishaq or Isaac. But Isaac had a brother, Ishmael or Ismail. And who are the descendants of Ismail? The Arabs. And where did Muhammad come from? Salam, from Abraham, Ibrahim through Ismail. Exactly. And if they said, no, 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 no. Because some of them have told me, no, no, that's talking about Jesus. Really? It said a prophet like Moses. A prophet like Moses, right? So let's look and see. Let's make our own comparison. Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. Peace be upon all of them. Moses was born how? Miracle birth or normal? Normal. But separated from his mother early on, right? Okay. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was born miracle or normal? But he also was separated from his mother early on because they took him to have a, a wet nurse that took care of him when he was a baby. And his dad died before he was born and then his mother died a little after that. Right? But it was normal birth. Jesus, peace be upon him, not normal birth. Miracle birth. No father. No father. Miracle. But he wasn't separated from his mother. He stayed with her all the time. In fact, he spoke about his mother from the cradle when he was a tiny baby. Defended his mother against the lies that they accused her of. Right? Right? Moses speak from the cradle? No. They said they, according to the Bible, they put him in a, 
a little thing and put him in the water and he was floating down and he cried, but that's about it. Moses was, grew up to be a normal boy. And then one day, became a prophet. Right? So, same for Muhammad Sallallahu Grew up as a normal boy. One day became a prophet. Moses was a shepherd. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a shepherd. They both had sheep, goats, stuff like that. But both of them were engaged physically in fights at some time or another. Both of them had killed people. Is that true? Jesus, according to them, never killed anybody. According to them, he was just, you know, very innocent of everything, according to them. Now, this is interesting. We could go through their whole life and compare and compare and compare and see who is compared to who. Moses had a book. Everybody knows that. The books of Moses. They always talk about the books of Moses. The commandments that came with Moses on Mount Sinai, right? Where did they come? Where did it start? Revelation for Moses starts on Mount Sinai, right? Is that a mountain? Turisin is a mountain. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gets revelation where? In the mountain. Same. And he's, we still have the book. We still know about it. Isa, or Jesus, peace be upon him, he starts immediately when he's a baby. And nobody has ever seen this book. Have you ever heard a book called Jesus? No. So you go through, one by one by one by one, you're going to see which one looks like what. Now, according to the Bible, it said, they believe Moses wrote it, but then all of a sudden, whoever wrote it said Moses died and he was buried. Well, that's pretty hard to do after you're dead right down. You know, I died and I was buried, you know. But anyway, he was died and he was buried. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu died and he was buried, right? According to the Bible, Jesus didn't stay in the ground. He went up to be with Allah. According to the Quran, he went up to be with the law. According to what we know, he didn't die. Point is, they're not the same. The ones that's the same is Muhammad and Moses. Peace be upon him. That's a good point. You don't have to elaborate it. You don't have to drive people crazy with it and go on and on. But at least you should mention this to them. That if you really believe your book, read it and think about it. Problem with a lot of people, though, you know what? It doesn't matter what you say, they're not going to listen. Have you shown them something? No, 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 no. It's not that. You say, well, it says that. It says red right there. Red. R-E-D. Yeah, but you have to read it in the spirit to understand. It means blue. <laughs> well, over here it says up. U-P. Up. Yes, but brother, you have to have faith. It means down. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Many miracles come with prophets. This is how Allah gives them the clear identification so you know you've got to follow them. In Surah Arum, for instance, it begins immediately talking about the Romans had been defeated in the nearest land, which was the Arabian Peninsula. And after this defeat, though, they're going to be victorious within three to nine years. It's a word in Arabic that means three to nine years. And sure enough, they were badly defeated in Antioch in 613. And as a result, the Persians swiftly pushed them on all fronts. It was hard to imagine the Romans would ever defeat the Persians. But sure enough, the Quran was right because the Romans were victorious within three to nine years. It was in the year 622, nine years after the Romans' defeat. The two forces met again on Armenian soil. The result was decisive victory in favor of the Romans. MashaAllah. 
prophecy was fulfilled. Now that's a prophecy though in the time of Muhammad. So the detractors from Islam would say, well, well, he made it up after the fact. Never mind the fact that we know when it was revealed because people were reciting it. But they'll still say, well, I don't believe that. I don't want to believe that. It's not mentioned in this book. But most of you will know it when I mention it to you. The most amazing miracle that I know of dealing with the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, is one that I thought about after I saw a movie called Back to the Future. <laughs> haram, haram. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the movie Back to the Future talks about a guy who goes in the past then he wants to go back to the future. They had another sequel to it where he goes into the future. Then a third sequel to it where he goes in the future. And then he goes way in the past back to the old west. And then goes back and forth. He's going back and forth and back and forth. Michael J. Fox was in that. But I thought about this and then I thought about something. Nobody could really predict things that happened in the ancient past that people are arguing about, they don't even know what it is for sure. But somebody to predict something in the past and then make a connection with that to something in the future. Do you think somebody could do that? That would be really tough. I want you to take a subject that happened, let's say, 3,000 years ago, okay? And I want you to take that subject and then predict something about it 1,500 years from now, and let's see how well you can do. Well, the good news is you won't be here, so nobody could blame you. <laughs> but the Quran is still here, and we just found out something in the 1970s. An amazing thing. For a long time, centuries, not just the Christians, but even some of the Jews, people have been arguing about Moses, alayhi salam, did he really even exist or was he just somebody that they made the story up about? Big time scholars of the Bible have actually said that this is just a nice story. There really wasn't anybody named Moses. There wasn't anybody named Pharaoh. There really was no incident of the Jews being taken into captivity or the punishment that they went through and then being saved and taken away from that. It's just something that somebody made up. And they even say it was made up probably during the Babylonian exile, which did happen. This is on record. And when they came back from it, they just put all that together to kind of, you know, encourage the troops and stuff like that. This is actually in books that I've read about the scholars of the Old Testament. So the Prophet wasallam only repeats what he hears. The angel Jibril is a representative of Allah and tells him to recite. He recites and what he hears he recites and the people recite the same thing and we've been doing that mouth to ear and ear to mouth ever since. In the Quran there's a statement, a strange statement that was actually discovered by a non-Muslim in the early 70s. He was one of the world's top surgeons and lecturers, scientists from France, Dr. Maurice Bukai. He was asked to go to Cairo, Egypt to examine the corpse of a mummy. They wanted to do some forensic work on it to get some information and discover whatever they could from this mummy. He was amazed because he said, we can prove that this person died of drowning. He was asphyxiated, meaning that his lungs filled with water and he died from this. He said, therefore, I have to conclude from this and the time period, this fits exactly the story of the Bible, this was Pharaoh of the time of Moses. And he was so amazed, he was shocked. But do you know what happened? The people in Cairo, happened to be Muslims of course, they said, this is no big deal, we already know that. 
He said, yes, but we've discovered him. And they said, well, we know that too. He said, no, I mean, we, this is his body. And it's here. And they said, well, we know because it's in the Quran. He said, the what? So he gets introduced to a subject called the Arabic language. He began to study it until he could understand the Arabic well enough to actually translate for himself every single word. Because he wanted to know what is this book. Because it says in it that Allah is going to punish Pharaoh in a very specific way. That he is going to drown him but he's going to preserve his body as a sign and sure enough he's a sign for all to see today because that body has been put on tour and taken all around the world to show this Pharaoh if you haven't seen it I have I saw it when it was an exhibition in Chicago happened to be up there went to the museum and saw it they've toured this body around the world and said most likely this could be Moses the, not Moses himself, but the Pharaoh of Moses' time. There he is. Amazing. Huh? But that's not where it ends. Dr. Bukhai continued his study until he managed to go through the disciplines of geology and geography, astronomy, embryology, and prove without a shadow of a doubt that every single reference in the Quran to science is absolutely, emphatically proven to be correct. It was his book that was first published in the French language that really stood the science people up on their ear. It was translated then into the English language and it was called in English the Bible, the Quran, and science. He wrote another book, The Origin of Man, because it became evident without any doubt what Allah had said in the Quran proves there is a God, a creation, and human beings did not come from monkeys. And we believe that as Muslims. Although I still wonder, you know, when I look at my brother-in-law, I can't help but think that, never mind, this is another subject. I mean, his knuckles dragged the ground, this guy is, anyhow. <laughs> I just want to see if you're awake. Anyhow, Dr. Keith Moore, top embryologist in his field, a world-renowned embryologist in Toronto, Canada, also made the same conclusion that Dr. Bukai had made after he studied the Quran in the Arabic language. I have it on my website. You can see the video, two videos we have of Dr. Keith Moore speaking about the Quran and embryology and saying it is impossible that anybody even a hundred years ago could have so well described the formation and what happens at the time of conception when a baby is conceived in the womb of the mother and the development of it through the trimesters until the time that it's delivered. He said this is impossible even a hundred years ago, much less 1400 years ago in the desert of Arabia. He said, therefore, I have to conclude that the Quran is from Allah. He pronounces it Allah. It's on our website, you can see it. Now, the difference between Dr. Bukai and Dr. Keith Moore is that Dr. Bukai, before he passed away, became a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. And I know brothers who actually used to pray with him, talked about him, said he was a great guy. But Dr. Moore, even though he said it was from Allah, he did not decide to become a Muslim. In fact, as recent as a couple of years ago, he was approached by the FBI and asked, why are you endorsing a book of terrorism? So he had to recant all of that and said, no, 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 I don't want to say anything about it anymore. That's exactly what happened. Regardless of what anybody says about the science and about the Quran, 
The bottom line is this. It's not a book about science. Oh, there's scientific things in it. It's not a book of poetry, although it's very poetic and it's very beautiful. It's not a book of history, although it very clearly defines the historical things that took place. It's not a book of prophecy, although it prophesied past and future events. It's a book of guidance. That's the specific purpose of the Quran itself. And the purpose of this Quran is to guide who? Mankind and jinn. Because we were only created for one purpose. And Allah tells us in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنْ وَالْإِنْسِ إِلَى لِيَعْبَدُونَ That He only created us to worship Him alone without any partners. But how will we know how to do that? Without guidance, people would make up something to represent Allah and they'd make their own way to worship it. In fact, many people say, well, what difference does it make if I believe in one God? Does it matter how I worship Him? Have you heard that argument? All of us have. Who cares, you know? Guy said he's a Buddhist. Another guy said he's a Hindu. Somebody else said he's a Christian. We all believe there's really only one God. What difference does it make? Leave us alone, you know? We're okay. We're all going to make it, right? Wrong. Wrong. Nobody's religion is going to get to Allah. Nobody's religion will get to Allah. Only the way that Allah has prescribed himself. So if anybody's made up a way, why would Allah be obliged to accept it? Somebody said, well, I think the best way to, to worship God is to take a tree, cut it down, and make it in the shape of a big sphere, you know, and a round ball, and then jump up and down in front of it five times a day. Huh? Yeah, I like that, he says. No more. In fact, I'll pick it up twice every year, and that'll be part of my worship. It's a great big thing, but I'll do that to show how much I love God. But did God ask him to do that? No. He just made it up. I saw Christians, they were weightlifters. They call themselves the power team. Power team for Jesus. <laughs> Lifting weights for Jesus. On television. Anybody ever heard of that? They did it, man. Lifting weights for Jesus. I guess he appreciated it. Save him all that effort, huh? <laughs> what kind of stuff is this? Is the law going to accept that? This is what it means when we talk about in the deen and the law, he'll Islam. Allah is only going to accept that which he has ordained. He's only going to accept that you submit to what he wants you to do. So the only way you can do that is to know what it is. I'm going to conclude tonight's program by mentioning this. Every Muslim every day asks for guidance. All of us do. We're constantly asking Allah to guide us. Some Christians made fun of us for that. Yeah. They said, why? You don't know that you're guided? We are nowhere guided. All we did was say, Jesus is God, Son of God, died on the cross, blah, 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 and now we're guided. Alhamdulillah, we don't have to do anything else. Whereas with us, as Muslims, we're constantly asking Allah, guide us, guide us, guide us. Right? How many times a day do we say, Idina Suratul Mustaqim? Guide us to the straight path. Immediately after this seven verse prayer, look what Allah says in the Quran. A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, alif lam mim, dhalikul kitabu la rayba fi, hudil lil mutakin, alladina yukminuna bil ghaibi wa yukimuna salata, wa mimma rizaknuhum yunfikun. Now I'll stop right there because the point I want to make is right there in the very beginning. Hudil lil mutakin. This is the book wherein there is no doubt and it is a source of guidance for those who fear their Lord. They have taqwa for Allah. You ask for guidance and he told you, there it is. This is it. This is the book. There's no doubt in it. Meaning what? There must be a book out there with some doubt in it, no? Huh? And this one has no doubt in it. But it's not going to guide anybody 
except those who have taqwa for Allah, believe in the ghaib, which is the unseen, establish their salah, and pay the zakah. For the benefit of those brothers or sisters who think that I'm Muslim and that's it, I don't need to pray, you're not guided. Allah said that in that verse real clear. Understand, no salah, mafi hidayah. And you're just playing a game with your own brain and you're going to lose. No salah, no hidayah. You want the Quran to guide you? Establish the salah. Got it? That's where it's at. We ask Allah to guide all of us. We ask Allah to forgive us. We ask Allah to put us on the manhaj of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the methodology of our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. And we ask him to open our minds and hearts to know more about the seerah or the biography of our beloved Nabi, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amin. The first question everybody always asks me, how did you come to Islam? The answer is on my website. <laughs> Go to islamtomorrow.com, I-S-L-A-M-T-O-M-O-R-R-O-W.com, and read about priests and preachers entering Islam. A Catholic priest entered Islam the night before I did. Alhamdulillah, I came to Islam. My wife immediately came right after me. Later, my father, my children, and a few members of my family and still I'm working on others. That was 14 years ago. A lot of people ask me that question, so I'll get that one out of the way first. A lot of people also ask the question about people coming into Islam these days. And how can we give dawah to them? I will tell you, Islam is still the fastest growing religion in the world. Alhamdulillah. And it's not because of us. <laughs> it's in spite of us. This is from Allah. The Christians spend millions of dollars and have teams going out for all their different denominations working really hard. We don't have anybody doing anything. <laughs> and they're coming to us like crazy. <laughs> and they keep bashing Islam and saying how abusive we are to women. That's like their number one thing. Islam has nothing for women. No women's rights. Abusive to women. Don't go there. Who's the number one coming into Islam? Women. Four to five to ten times as much as the men. <laughs> and what did Allah say? They plan, and Allah plans, and who's the best of planners? <laughs> Allah <Allahu> Akbar! <laughs> Cigarettes. 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 Halal. Yeah, as long as you don't light it. <laughs> The minute you light it, actually, you know, cigarette smoke kills innocent people because anybody in the room with you or in the automobile with you, even a child breathing that can contract cancer and they can have that latent inside of them for years and then later develop it after they're full grown. It happened to my wife. She never smoked in her life, yet she had cancer which almost killed her she still suffers from the effects 20 years later because her parents were heavy smokers so not only can you be asked about the damage you do to yourself you may actually be on the day of judgment accused of murder i highly recommend if you have that habit get rid of it quick not good ah Somebody's asking about, can a Muslim marry a non-Muslim? Can a, mar a Muslim marry a non-Muslim? The general answer is no. Just if you want a fast answer on that, it's no. Allah alam. But here's why. When you say a non-Muslim, you've included everybody that's not Muslim. That includes atheists, Buddhists, Hindus, everything. Allah said in the Quran, it's believers marrying believers. When there are special occasions that occur, there is permission and it has limits. Islam has a concept, it's very nice, called rights and limits. Rights, but limits. 
Even though the Sahabi, radiallahu anhu ajmain, traveled all the way to China, they traveled all the way into Spain, across the northern part of Africa, they, uh, Islam went everywhere. But even though they went to all these places, they were not allowed to marry the women unless the women became believers. They had to be believers. Even when Allah speaks about the Ahl Kitab, the women from them, there's two conditions there that are real clear. They have to be believers in the book and they have to be virgins. And here in Australia, <laughs> I heard about the beach in the summertime. Okay, forget about it. <laughs> the reality is, many times, I visited so many communities. I visit three or four communities every week, 52 weeks a year. So after visiting maybe 300 communities, 400 communities every single year, I'm telling you, it's absolutely the same problem over and over and over. When I'm getting ready to leave, a brother always comes up to me, brother, I need to talk to you in private. Brother, I need to talk to you in private. I just got to ask you one thing. See, I got to talk to you. Please, please. And then we step over to the side. And the first words from his mouth is, see, my wife, she's not a Muslim. And here's my problem. I said, no, no, you already told me the problem. You just told me the problem. Your wife's not a Muslim because it's going to get worse. Do you have any children? No. And I said, then just get away quick before you do. Because if you're already having problems, you think it's going to get better after you have children? No. No, it's not. You cannot make these women become believers. A lot of men think they can do that. A lot of men have this idea that they're some kind of macho, you know, religious wonder who are, they're going to just do amazing things and this girl is going to convert to Islam and by the way he doesn't even pray <laughs> or barely you know doesn't even know how to make wudu and now he's going to go out here and grab this girl and he's going to twist her brain around and she's just going to fall in love with him and he's going to lead her straight to Allah ha <laughs> ha this is really sad and if they have children it gets even worse there is really no Islamic state on earth today. There is no Khalifa. There's no Islamic state. You cannot really and truly guarantee that you are able to give the proper rights to your wife or to your children when you try to do this kind of thing, when you marry a woman that's not a Muslim. Even if she's Ahl Kitab. Because, and I have talked to some of these women. Alhamdulillah, some of them will enter Islam, and that's beautiful. But for those who don't enter into Islam, what happens, they wind up resenting the husband. They start working against him. They start figuring ways to mess him up so that he won't pray. Or that he won't fast. They'll cook something. Oh, I forgot you're fasting, but I made this milk. Why don't you go ahead and eat it? They'll purposely expose him to things, trying to get him away from the dean. They become shaitan to him. And when they have children, they use that against him. I'm not saying every woman does that, but that's the rule. It's not the exception. So if you find a woman that's a real believer, that really follows her book, that's great. But I doubt you're going to find one who's that religious who wants to come over and marry a terrorist, you know? <laughs> I got to wonder about that. Because they believe there's something wrong with us. Why would they be coming over to us? Huh? I remember one sheikh was talking about a brother brought a lady to him. This was in upstate New York. The imam was saying that here comes this brother, brings the lady in, and he says, she's Ahl Kitab, we want to get married. He said, okay, step out of the room. He goes, huh? He said, I want to talk to her. Step out of the room. 
So he said he started talking to her. He asked her, he said, uh, you're a Christian? She said, oh, more or less. He said, um, okay, you go to church? Nah. Do you read the Bible? No. Do you pray? Nah. Do you know the Ten Commandments? What's that? Can you read the Lord's Prayer? Uh, yeah. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord must slowly keep, or something like that, right? It's not even close, by the way. That's what little kids say. So this is a girl, no clue, right? Just Christian by name. He brought the brother back in. He said, okay, I can't do this marriage. He said, Achi, she's Ahu Kitab, Ahu Kitab. He said, Ahu Checkbook. <laughs> yeah, watch out. It's not going to benefit her, and it's not going to benefit you to have a marriage like that. You don't want to make her miserable. Let her go her way. This is a man. 60-year-old former city council inspector and church leader with a wife and children. He admits... to killing 10 very sick-minded way he dealt with these people. Unbelievable how he tortured them and killed them, mutilated their bodies, and did sex even with their dead bodies. Right here. Today's paper. Another one right beside it. Place called, how do you pronounce Auckland? Auckland? Okay. Former leader of the Christian political party yesterday pleaded guilty to more charges of sexual abuse against young girls. In the Christchurch District Court, he admitted to five sexual offenses against girls under 12. He's 46 years old. He had earlier pleaded guilty to another independent assault of a girl eight years old. And when he did this, he was married and had 10 children. This explains why when people hear about Islam, they confuse it with their lifestyle and say horrible things. It's because they don't understand. Islam forbids any sex at all outside of marriage. Can we have girlfriends? No. Can the girls have boyfriends? You know, what they call hang out together, palimony, buddies, you know, just, you know. Have a few kids together and decide whether or not they want to get married. You know, they do that. They call them love children. We used to call them bastards. That's what it says in the dictionary. When the parents don't get married. They didn't call them love children. It's amazing, isn't it? By the way, have you thought about this? When you balance things out in Islam, you, you really learn a lot. A man in Islam is forbidden to marry a woman who's already married. But a woman in Islam is allowed to choose from any man in the community as long as he doesn't have four. So who's the one with the limit here? If there's a hundred men and a hundred women, okay, hundred men and a hundred women, if most of the men are married, a woman can still choose wide open because she can still choose from any of those men the women are the ones that are having the bigger choice not the men a man has a limit of four and they cannot be married to somebody else whereas the woman has the choice of the whole entire community of men as long as they're not married to four is that true or false and she already knows how he'll treat her because he she sees look what he's doing with this lady 
I don't like that. I won't marry him. But I like what this guy does with that wife. I would like that for me. Okay, I'll marry him. It's easy as that. But what's happened is we Muslims have forgotten what Islam is really about. The men have forgotten and the women have forgotten and we're trying to make ourselves fit into something else. Another problem we have is we want to wait until we've got a PhD degree to get married. We want to wait until you get the degree and get the job and get the business going. Get all that money together so you can pay the $40,000 that you have to give over to her family to get married, right? That's totally out of Islam. That's forbidden in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, as soon as they're old enough, get them married. Get them married. Then you eliminate the problem. Simple as that. And you don't need these large amounts of money. Even if somebody doesn't have money at all, it can teach you one eye of the Quran. Isn't that true? But the problem is, again, we've been exposed to other people's society other people's understandings and we're following that instead of following Islam. Oh yeah, we still grow the beard, right? And we still run around with a kufi on the head and carry dicker beads and swing them around. <laughs> but we don't follow Islam. We really don't. Because we don't know what it is. We understand it. Alhamdulillah, we hope Allah will be merciful on us. But I was telling one of the brothers today, if Omar, radiallahu anhu, or any of the Sahabi would come in and see us, I'm sure they'd be talking to each other going, what are these guys? What's up with this? Look at them. Look how they treat each other. Look at the way they act. Wow. What religion do you think they're on? I don't know. Listen to them, they're reciting something. What is that? I don't know. It's not Quran. We know that. And look, they're trying to line up. Not very good. There's somebody stepping out in front of them. It looks like you're leading them. What are they doing? Is that Salat? Nah. <laughs> not even close. About the only thing they might recognize if we said La ilaha illallah. And that might be the only thing to stop them from cutting our heads off. That's how bad we really are. I might be wrong. Is Reba really haram? <laughs> the only commandment in the Quran that has a verse associated with it that says Allah and his messenger declare harb, war on you. And you ask, is it really haram? That's amazing. But Sheikh, we have a fatwa. We have a fatwa. Oh, really? Yeah, the fatwa says the first house, you can buy it on Reba. If, uh, you know, if you really need to, it's okay. And that way I can use my money for other stuff. I need to buy a new car and some furniture. And so it's okay. And then maybe if I, but can I get the second house on Reba too? We have a fatwa. We have a fatwa said, I'm sorry, brother, you're mispronouncing that. That's Feswa. <laughs> I can't believe he said that. Whoa. <sighs> I was coming down the steps in the masjid in New York. Some of the young Shabab were up ahead of me. They didn't know I was right behind them coming down the steps. The boys were telling each other, he's not a sheikh. Another one said, yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Why do you say that? Because he's funny. <laughs>
pray as you have and seen me pray. To lead Words, pray. Ramadan, renewal Next. of faith, documentaries. In we at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.